In eight months, or perhaps as little as six, NASA will embark on an adventure that has actually never been duplicated in the past. Although many people regard Artemis II as just being a routine orbit of the moon, no different than previous Apollo missions that accomplished the same thing, there is a fundamental difference between this mission and all of the Apollo missions that came before it. And I'm not just talking about the diversity of the crew, the fact that there's a woman this time, or four people instead of three, or a black man on board, or a non-American. Although all of these things are significant, there's a lot more going on with Artemis II that, for the most part, is not being covered in the general media, and yet is still quite significant. As a matter of fact, unless everything goes absolutely perfect with this mission. Our hopes of putting human beings on the lunar surface before 2030 seem very unlikely indeed. Therefore, it is absolutely crucial that this mission go smoothly. Otherwise, it is very possible that the West is going to have to cede mankind's return to the moon to the Chinese, and the first words that are transmitted from the surface of the moon in the 21st century will be spoken in Mandarin instead of English. Good afternoon, spaceflight enthusiasts, and welcome to Moon Week here on The Angry Astronaut. In the aftermath of Moon Day on July 20th, I'm going to be talking a lot about moon-related topics this week. And by the way, I want to make it 100% clear that the reason I have an issue with the People's Republic of China getting to the moon before the West does is not based on any notion that in some way the Chinese are are not as worthy or that I have a problem with them culturally or as a people or anything along those lines. It is instead the policies of their extremist government and the fact that their space program is directly controlled by the Chinese military, unlike virtually every other space program in the world, which is largely domesticated. China is a country that's carrying out a genocide that is every bit as serious as a matter of fact far more serious than what Israel is doing to Palestine right now. As a matter of fact, I would say that the Chinese are very happy that this Palestinian genocide is happening at the moment because it completely removes the world's attention to what they are doing to the Uyghur people, which is a completely focused and determined effort to a totally destroy those people's culture. That being the case, I don't want to get too much into Chinese policies. I just wanted to make sure that people understood why I believe that China's intentions will be less than beneficent should they gain dominion over the moon and that it's the objective and the responsibility of the rest of the world to prevent that from happening. All that being said, then, let's go ahead and get back to Artemis 2, which, as most people know, isn't going to be landing on the moon, but is still going to be accomplishing things that NASA has never done before. Now, first of all, NASA has never in its history flown four astronauts into interplanetary space. This will be the most ambitious interplanetary mission, at least if we're talking about the number of crew members on the flight that NASA has ever launched. It's also worth noting that NASA has never sent a crew this old into interplanetary space either. Virtually all of these astronauts are at least 10 years old older than the Apollo astronauts were. NASA commander is Reed Wiseman, an aviator with the U.S. Navy, who has 165 days worth of space experience on Expedition 41, which flew to the International Space Station between May and November of 2014. And then NASA pilot Victor Glover, the first black astronaut to 
fly around the moon or to fly into interplanetary space for that matter, served as the pilot on the Crew-1 flight of SpaceX's Crew-1 capsule that launched on November 15, 2020. The most experienced astronaut on board is also the only female, NASA mission specialist Christina Koch, who was selected by NASA in 2013 and on her previous mission. She flew a record-setting 328 days in space. She actually has more time in space than the rest of the crew combined, and her presence on this mission is going to be vital, not just because she's a woman, but the fact that no female has ever flown into interplanetary space, and we need to know how solar radiation and cosmic rays are going to affect the female body as opposed to a male's body. And then, of course, we have the first non-American, the first Canadian, Jeremy Hansen, also on this mission. A totally different crew than the types of crew that flew on the Apollo flights. Now, the mission trajectory that this mission will take is known as a hybrid free return, which will see the spacecraft orbit Earth twice to pick up speed for the translunar injection. Orion will then swing around the moon on a free return trajectory to make a direct return back to our planet. Keep in mind that the only Apollo mission that carried out a free return trajectory was Apollo 13. Even though Apollo 8 orbited the moon, it was placed into a low lunar orbit to simulate the beginning of an Apollo mission that would ultimately set down on the surface of the moon, whereas this is on a free return trajectory that actually passes a significant distance past the moon before it returns, therefore carrying these astronauts further away from Earth than any humans have ever traveled. The mission is expected to last between 8 and 10 days, but may be extended to as long as 3 weeks depending on the mission objectives. The four astronauts on board Artemis 2, as I mentioned before, will be the furthest people to fly from Earth, assuming the new mission reaches its expected maximum altitude of 8,889 kilometers above the moon's surface. The European Space Agency says that the mission will need to achieve the following milestones. Number one, launch from NASA's Kennedy Space Center, launch pad 39B, to low Earth Earth orbit, as you're seeing right here. A maneuver in Earth orbit to raise the perigee, or lowest point of the orbit, roughly 40 minutes after liftoff. This will be performed with the SLS ICPS, or Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. Then number three, a burn to raise the apogee, or highest part of the orbit, again using the ICPS. Number four, a system check at 42 hours after the mission begins to ensure that the orbit is correct ranging from 185 kilometers at the closest point to 2,600 kilometers at the highest point. And incidentally, at that 2,600 kilometer distance, these astronauts will already have traveled further from Earth than any astronauts after Apollo. The ICPS will be disposed, and Orion will then do a translunar injection to fly to the moon. The trip to the moon will take four days and have a maximum altitude of 8,889 kilometers above the moon's surface. And then the spacecraft will finally return home, and once the spacecraft will close to Earth, the crew module will separate from the European service module and the crew module adapter, allowing for a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Training for the mission will take approximately 18 months, and that training is nearly complete, by the way. Ascent training will include pre-launch operations around the launch pad and give the crew a deep understanding of major milestones leading up to and during the launch, as well as the first few hours in orbit. By the way, what you're watching right now is Orion maneuvering close to the ICPS. The objective in doing that is to prepare the astronauts and the Orion for eventually docking with other objects, both in Earth orbit and also in lunar orbit. Because keep in mind, eventually this spacecraft will be docking with the Lunar Gateway Space Station and also with lunar landers such as Lunar Starship and the Blue Origin Blue Moon. Now, you may recall that I mentioned that this mission could theoretically be extended to three weeks or so. 
This is a luxury that Apollo never had. The Apollo capsule, and especially the LEM, did not have an ambitious enough life support system to sustain three astronauts for three weeks, let alone four. Orion's recycling life support system is capable of sustaining four astronauts for nearly a month, something that Apollo could never hope to do. And another improvement that will be tested on Artemis 2 is the Artemis 2 Optical Communications System, or O2O, which is a laser communications system capable of transmitting 260 megabits per second worth of information from the moon to Earth, therefore capable of sending down 4K high-definition video from the moon. And incidentally, the entire Saturn V computer, the computer that can controlled the rocket that took us to the moon for the first time had 896k worth of total memory less than one meg of memory for the entire rocket and this communication system can send about 300 times that memory in a single second a big improvement over apollo to say the least now, another international aspect of this mission is the fact that five international CubeSats will be deployed on the Artemis II mission. Currently, this includes a mission from the Germans, from the DLR spaceflight organization, and also from Saudi Arabia. Interestingly enough, the other three CubeSats, at least to my knowledge, have not been announced yet, although they must definitely have been approved at this point, given the short amount of time that remains before Artemis 2 lifts off. And perhaps the most important aspect of Artemis 2 is this is going to be the acid test for all of the critical systems for the rocket and the space capsule that is going to be taking astronauts to the moon for the foreseeable future. We don't have an effective replacement for SLS yet. Starship is a long ways away from being able to replace this system, and we really don't have anything else that ca that's capable of doing the entire job. Meaning that when the SLS Block 1B, which you're watching right now, comes into service, it's very likely that all the bugs are going to be worked out with Orion at least, which means all of the effort can be focused on the exploration upper stage portion of the rocket, which is going to be a brand new component with four RL-10 engines as opposed to the one RL-10 for the ICPS and a much bigger payload capability capable of not only launching Orion but also over 10 metric tons of additional cargo. For example, components of the Lunar Gateway can be launched in the same mission as a fully crewed Orion or perhaps some sort of future lunar lander could also be contained inside the exploration upper stage and launch together with Orion, therefore allowing for a complete lunar mission, including a landing on the moon to be carried out with a single launch. <laughs> In other words, doing the same thing that Apollo did, except with more people and with a heavier payload. And by the way, when people comment and ask why was Apollo capable of carrying humans all the way to the lunar surface and back with a single launch, whereas SLS still requires a separate lunar lander in order to do the job, it's important to keep in mind that the extra cargo that the exploration upper stage is able to carry, in other words, everything apart from the crew capsule, the service module and everything else weighs more than the entire Apollo 11 lunar module dry. That is to say, the lunar module minus its propellant weighed less than just the extra payload that SLS can carry in its Block 1B format, meaning that this is a lot more payload, a lot heavier payload than Apollo ever tried to carry all the way to the moon. And there's no way to deposit this much stuff on the the surface of the moon in a single launch. It requires two separate components. If you want to duplicate what Apollo did, you certainly can, but you're not going to be putting much on the lunar surface with every launch of your Saturn V. The SLS plus HLS component allows much, much more to be put on the lunar surface. 
four astronauts instead of two. 20 metric tons with the Blue Moon lander and 100 metric tons theoretically with Starship as opposed to only 318 kilograms of scientific equipment with the Apollo LEM. Just the Blue Moon, the smaller lunar lander in the Artemis program, can carry 60 times as much payload to the surface of the moon as Apollo could, meaning that if you want to establish large habitation structures on the lunar surface that will house astronauts for months at a time, this is the only real way to do it. Doing it with Saturn V was just not practical, not 318 kilograms at a time. Even though Werner von Braun had ideas for much bigger Saturn V rockets, mega Saturn Vs that could carry a lot more payload to the moon, that would have been cataclysmically expensive compared to what we have right now with SLS and HLS. As expensive as it is, Werner von Braun's Super Saturn V would have been more expensive still. So I hope you can see that Artemis 2 is going to be a lot more than just a quick orbit of the moon and coming back. This is a very important mission. If it doesn't go close to flawlessly, it may require another orbit of the moon before NASA is going to feel comfortable enough to try to land on the lunar surface, which once again is going to give China the edge in a very big way, something the West cannot afford to allow to happen. So, as I said, a critical mission, a mission that's coming up very soon, perhaps as soon as six months or eight months at the outside, and I can't wait to see it happen. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and also please consider supporting this channel's 200,000 subscriber celebration with some exclusive merchandise that will only be available for the next three weeks, or if you'd like to support the channel in some other way, please consider joining us on Patreon. All the details are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.